when you when you purchase toys or even infant things you you make sure that it's not going to end up killing someone Counterfeiting products is a multi-billion dollar global industry. And though counterfeit products like watches and handbags steal billions of dollars each year from retail brand owners, does it really affect the general public? It's still a crime though. What we're about to show you is that counterfeit products can not only be harmful to your health, but they can also be deadly. But our first story focuses on the counterfeiting of one of the most popular types of collectibles of all, sports memorabilia. We're going to show you how collectors are often defrauded by fake reproductions. Now, everyone can imagine a child's eyes lighting up as they receive that ball or team jersey signed by their favorite player. But how would they feel if they discovered that the item was signed by some fraudster in another country and not their actual sports hero? According to one shocking statistic, over 50% of all sports memorabilia is actually counterfeit. We're going to show you ways to protect yourself against collectible fraud. The victims of sports memorabilia fraud, the, the saddest victims are the people who purchase it, particularly the kids. Experts in the sports memorabilia industry estimate that they take in about $1 billion a year. The fraudulent portion of the sports memorabilia industry is about 10%, so you're looking at about $100 million a year. Every year, thousands of collectors from around the world attend the National Sports Collectors Convention in Chicago to buy, sell, and trade valuable sports memorabilia. When people walk into a sports collectible show or they think of sports collectibles, they don't realize just how much money this stuff is worth, but these have actually become almost asset classes in and of themselves. People don't just buy them because they like the stuff, they buy them because they're long-term investments, and because of that, they want to get value. When things get to be worth the kind of money that they're worth, there's always a chance for fraud. And whenever there's a chance of fraud, there's a chance for people with a lot of money uh, to pay a lot for something that's worth absolutely nothing. Pretty much anyone you ask has at least one horror story about being buying a fake autograph or buying a card that had been recolored or doctored. Some horror story that they, you know, maybe at the time it turned them off to collecting. The forgers in, uh, in sports memorabilia fraud uh, will forge anything. It's basically a... Uh, consumer-driven fraud, uh, whether the consumer knows they're uh, you know, purchasing fraudulent items from the forger or not, the forger will provide whatever they want. One of the most difficult things about bringing these types of people to justice is proving that they are knowingly selling fraudulent merchandise. But the card's supposed to be at least 2.1 centimeters, but this is 1.5. The extent of sports memorabilia fraud was so large that the Federal Bureau of Investigation decided to tackle the problem themselves. The FBI set up a task force called Operation Bullpen to target criminals selling counterfeit sports memorabilia. When Operation Bullpen was going down in Southern California, third party authentication was being performed, but it turned out that it was a, again, it was a fraudulent uh, ring and they were selling fake autographs. They'd sign it very carefully forge the signature and then authenticate it because they were a uh, authorized authenticator. And they would just make a ton of money. Sad. 
Operation Bullpen allowed the FBI to penetrate the counterfeit market using search warrants and wiretaps. So what we decided to do was to try and basically look at the industry as a whole. It was uh, fairly successful, although it wasn't as successful as we would have liked. There were some bigger targets that refused to do business with the undercover agent because they would only deal with people that they had known basically their entire lives. They started out legitimate and they found out that the fraud was, was too easy and there was so much of it, they felt almost compelled to go to the dark side. The cost of counterfeit products are believed to be in the A, 100 to 500,000 per year, B, 10 to 50 million per year, C, 800 million to 1 billion per year, or D, hundreds of billions of dollars per year. The correct answer is D. While the overall extent of counterfeiting is unknown, some sources place the value of counterfeit products to over $600 billion per year. People who commit uh, sports memorabilia fraud are charged with either uh, mail fraud or wire fraud or conspiracy uh, to commit those crimes. There's certainly been a, a maturity of this business, an evolution in this business where more people are educating themselves, they're understanding why it's important to have it evaluated by a reputable third party because otherwise uh, you're, you're going to be susceptible to the fraud that will remain and will always remain somewhere in the marketplace. The need for authenticity is, is at the highest point right now. Uh, and when I talk about that, what I mean is that when you buy something, you have to know it's real. No one in their right mind is going to buy anything of value that is not authenticated by a company they can trust. You're walking around here blind. And You're when, blind you, when, you, when you go to resell things, they all want to know who authenticates it. What we've got here is the legendary Black Betsy bat that belonged to Shoeless Joe Jackson. Sold last night in our Platinum Night event for over $540,000. This is uh, authenticated by a third-party authentication firm called PSA DNA. Uh, they provided it with a game uh, with a grade of GU10, which is the highest grade a game used bat can get. Uh, so, based on all the information that they had, the photographic evidence, uh, the will from Joe Jackson's wife, uh, and the newspaper articles, all that together created the provenance that they needed to give it a perfect grade. You got to ask questions. Uh, you got to ask the guy in the store or the person that you're talking to on the internet. Uh, I want to know where this came from, who owned it. You got to ask those questions. And if it, they can't tell you that, then you know I would stay away from them. If you want to get the best quality, you have to pay for it. That's, that's what this industry and every other collectibles industry is about. You get what you pay for. Yeah, you know, we, we have a saying at, at our company, avoid becoming a bargain hunter. When you are obsessed with the price of an item and trying to get a steal, you are gonna go right down the road to forgeries and overgraded material. There's money to be made, there, there's going to be fraud. My client spent close to $8,000 for this ball thinking he had gotten a deal, thinking he had gotten the $15,000 example. And the reality is he has something that's not worth you know, the money, the, the ball that it's written on. Very rare to find a high quality, authentic item that is priced at, let's say, 50% of market. But it's very important to check the certificate of authenticity whenever you're buying an autograph or a game used memorabilia. Because if you buy one that's fake, it's not worth anything. It might be worth 10 bucks if you paid $50 for it. You always want to make sure the COA. We might sit there and talk and argue a little bit about cards and what, what we're going to buy, but. But, uh, you know, all in all, I, I like for him to pretty much buy what he wants to buy, and, and, but I also want it to be of value and not, you know, you throwing can, my money away. And throwing his money away. How many American jobs are lost each year to counterfeiters? A, 100,000. B, 500,000. C, 750,000, or D, 1 million jobs? Well, the correct answer is C. An estimated 750,000 jobs have been lost in the United States to counterfeiters, according to the United States Customs and Border Protection Agency. 
The business of counterfeit products is a multi-billion dollar global enterprise. But as you'll see in this upcoming story, sometimes the problem of counterfeit products is not just about money, but it's about something a whole lot more serious. It was our daughter's fifth birthday, and she wanted to go to Chuck E. Cheese for her birthday party. And we all went over there, and the general rule is, as you play the games and you receive the tokens, everyone receives their tokens, and then they give it to the child that has a birthday. So everyone pitched in all their tickets and gave it to our daughter, Alyssa, and she wanted a disco ball light, and that's what she received. I set it up on this one wall, and she had a big doll house that had a top floor on it that, that it sat on top of, and uh, they liked to turn it on sometimes at night and, you know, watch the lights for a little while before they'd go to bed. And, um, I had uh, I'd waited for a while. They were drifting off, so I went in there and turned it off. Um, I don't know if one of them turned it back on or, or what, but... The parents, Amy and Rob Bullock, won the globe from a reputable business and had no reason to assume that the prize wasn't safe. Often, counterfeit products are very difficult to distinguish from their legitimate counterparts. Victims of counterfeit fraud run the risk of not only losing money, sometimes it can even cost them their lives. I think it was about a quarter after six, and I got a phone call. It was uh, someone from the sheriff's office here in town said that I needed to come over to Amy's house as soon as possible. There's been an accident. So uh, let me know what's going on, you know? Where are my kids? And then she told me that uh, both my son and my daughter I had trouble finding them at first because the smoke was so thick and it was so dark and I couldn't see. I couldn't see anything. But um, once I did find them, I carried them out, tried to give them breaths, but couldn't get any air to go in. And then the next thing I remember, I looked up, I could see the figure of a fireman coming towards me. And, he took one of the children and headed towards the ambulance, and I picked up the other child and followed behind him. And then sat there beside the ambulance for forever. Initially, the fire marshal thought that a faulty CD player might have been the culprit for the fire, but after further investigation, the true source was revealed. Yeah, the parents came to us uh, in order to help them determine what happened and why. The local fire marshal did an investigation, and at the conclusion of his investigation, um, was able to say the origin and the source of the fire was at a point where there was a disco light plugged in. Someone asked me what was on top of the dollhouse. And then that's when it came to light that it was the, the disco ball that was on the dollhouse. We're focusing the case at this point on a toy that was made in China and made it to America without, as far as we can tell, any UL certification, um, any type of safety checks, any type of um, interest on behalf of the company that, ended, that sold it as to whether or not the toy was safe. In, in our case at CSA International, one of the areas that we have concerns with are extension cords, because if, if the examples that we've seen pose a potential fire and a shock hazard, we've seen products such as extension cords, power bars, all of these products that are in the legitimate marketplace also uh, are capitalized by the counterfeiters to, to supplement the marketplace. The hardest part for me was when I went to the hospital to ask Amy what had happened, and she had been, she was in, in the room crying hysterically, and family was around her, and she said, someone needs to go see the kids and make sure they're okay. So I. I had to go and, and 
go to the mortuary and, and that was the <clears throat> hardest part was uh, identifying them. One of the toys, the one that was uh, similar to a, an exemplar to the toy that caused the fire in the Bullock's house, um, our experts have had um, success, I guess you would say, in the toy melting up on itself and catching on fire. The counterfeiter comes along and copies the packaging, copies the outside, but doesn't look at the safety issues relating to it, and then puts it out to the public, and then the public uses it and it breaks down within a very short period of time, the public thinks that it was made by the actual company. It would be impossible for a consumer to tell the difference, impossible for the, the consumer to take any steps to determine which of the toys would be safe. The only person in position to do that would be the buyer of the toys from the supplier. The impact of counterfeit products on the companies that we represent has been increasing at an incredible exponential rate over the years. This is a multi-billion dollar problem. They're not abiding by the laws and putting forth safe products, as a result of which the, count the counterfeiters are detrimentally affecting the reputation and the goodwill built up by companies that have worked very hard to have a good reputation. We assume that something that, you know, for children would be safe, you know, that there would be you know, that it would be made in such a way that it wouldn't, that there wouldn't be a risk of it catching fire. I think all parents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, when you, when you purchase toys or even infant things, you, you make sure that it's not gonna end up killing someone. And, and people, it's sick to say, but people really don't care. It's, the bottom line is, let's get it out there and let's make money and get on with our lives. But how many, how many innocent children have to die on faulty toys? What percentage of global trade is in counterfeit products? 6, 19, 42, or 78 percent. Counterfeit products amount to 6 percent of global trade, and that's a huge amount of money. In North America alone, counterfeiting diverts more than 250 billion a year into the hands of criminals. It's not just the financial cost. As we saw in our segment, counterfeit products can leave you seriously injured. I actually had like $1,500 stolen from my bank account last year. They uh, sent me an email saying, attention, this is urgent, you need to send us all your information. And just without thinking, I did. And then I went and checked my bank account, and there's $1,500 missing. One thing that happened to me last year is that I uh, was checking my, I was doing some online banking, and I discovered that there was a fraudulent check written on my account. And I discovered that what happened is that I used to carry around a blank check in my, my wallet and I obviously lost it. What I found out from the, my bank later is that uh, when the check went through my bank, they did not check the signature. Banks do not check signatures. That's one thing I discovered, which was a little unsettling. It was a couple of years ago. Uh, I didn't realize it until I got one of my credit card bank statements. Basically, uh, it was ranked up to like over a thousand, and I still have my credit card in my wallet. On that same day, it was like three different purchases, and it was like over, $500 each. I don't know what happened. And so I called the credit card company and they said they'll investigate. And I never actually got any like report. Basically just said, you know, we'll we'll credit that amount for you. But then they have to give me a new credit card. And I to this day I have no idea how they got a hold of my credit card. A friend of mine, um, her uncle received a phone call from someone who had a grandson, apparently was claiming to be the grandson, and requested money to get bailed out of jail. Yeah. And the uncle believed the story, was ready to cash some of his money out of um, his financial funds, yeah. and his financial advisor said, you know, wait a minute, we're gonna make a couple of phone calls, 
and um, verify some things, and it turned out to be a scam. But the uncle was ready to hand over the cash, and they're preying upon older, older people who are trusting and yeah. and willing to help out. It was through emails. It was targeted towards moms, and apparently it was a very common scam email that comes from. Um, apparently a mom and with two children traveling, mm -hmm. stranded, she claimed her bags were stolen, her wallet stolen, she needs plane ticket to get back to the back to the States and but please send you know I will pay you back mm -hmm. as soon as you come back. This is where I, I can be reached and it was some Western Union uh, a credit agency that you're supposed to wire money. Mm -hmm. But it was pre pretty obvious because it was very common emails where you address the, the, the wire to Western Union credit agency, but really no known email that she has access to that you could send money to. So. Right. And it was targeted to a lot of mom pleading for the guilt, the, 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 the emotions with two children. So that, that was the scam email. I think that if it was a real incident and where you really rob, you know, the, the, the first thing any mom would do is probably go to a local uh, police station and, 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 and really cry for help. I'm sure that the police station will be able to reach someone, the family members, or even will travel agencies if they really need to get back to the country.